The opening scene takes place in war-torn Iraq, where gunshots and explosions can be heard at any given time. In one such city, a bomb specialist team from the US spots a homemade explosive, also known as an IED. As a result, the military quickly evacuates the area, and the bomb disposal unit, led by Sergeant Matt Thompson, takes charge. Their plan is to use an advanced robotic drone to destroy the bomb. Sergeant Thompson believes that by using plastic explosives, they can safely detonate the IED from a distance. To carry out the operation, a small cart is affixed to the back of the robot drone, which is then dispatched into the area designated for the explosion. However, just before reaching the IED, the trailer loses one of its wheels. This makes the operation a complete failure. Now, with time running out, Matt decides to inspect the situation himself. He dons a bulky bomb suit and proceeds to the trailer, while his two teammates named Sergeant J.T. Sanborn and Specialist Owen remain behind, vigilant of their surroundings. Matt lifts the trailer and transports ports it to the IED, carefully setting it up as intended. But as he makes his way back, Owen notices that a man in a butcher shop is using a cell phone. He frantically alerts Sanborn and rushes towards the man, instructing him to drop the phone. But unfortunately, the man quickly dials a specific sequence of numbers, triggering the bomb's explosion. This kills poor Matt on the spot. After the tragic loss of their fellow soldier, Sanborn gathers Matt's personal belongings and prepares them to be sent home in a casket. Upon returning to the base, he meets with the new team leader of the bomb disposal unit, Sergeant William James, who is currently removing the plywood covers from his windows. Sanborn advises James to keep them on due to the risk of mortar shrapnel, but James dismisses the suggestion, stating that the covers would be ineffective if a mortar shell were to crash through the unit's roof. <laughs> Why bother wearing a bike helmet if you could get hit by an asteroid? The following day, the unit receives a report of another IED located on a narrow street in the city. Upon arrival, they meet up with another army platoon that had discovered the bomb. The leader of the platoon informs them that the bombs are located 20 meters down the street. In response, James puts on a bomb suit and proceeds alone. The entire incident is being observed by local residents from their rooftops and windows. As James approaches the bomb's area, he throws a smoke grenade, claiming it is for diversion diversionary purposes. This action causes agitation among his team members as they are unable to see him clearly. Upon reaching an intersection, a car stops in front of James, prompting him to point his gun at the driver. Other soldiers in the vicinity surround the car and instruct the driver to exit the vehicle, but despite their commands, the defiant individual refuses to comply. In response, James fires a shot at the car's front window, places his gun against the man's forehead, and demands that he move the vehicle backward. Eventually, the driver agrees and gets back back, where the other soldiers apprehend him and take him away. Shortly after, James comes across an artillery shell hidden beneath a small pile of garbage, which he easily disarms. He believes that the task is complete, but soon discovers a secondary wire. Pulling out its connection, he realizes it is linked to six more bombs. He then proceeds to disarm all the bombs without any fear. During this, an unknown guy secretly watches James from a nearby building, and upon witnessing his diffusing efforts, the person hurriedly descends the stairs. With the successful completion of their mission, James rejoins his teammates and Sanborn advises him to improve his communication during operations and not treat his duties as a solo endeavor. However, James dismisses the advice without much consideration. The next day, James is walking outside the military base when a young boy named Beckham approaches him, offering to sell DVDs. After persistent requests, James agrees and purchases one from the merchant, whom the boy works for. Afterwards, the bomb squad is deployed on another bomb defusing mission. This time, the bomb is inside a car parked illegally in front of a United Nations building. As the building is being evacuated, James puts on the bomb suit and approaches the car. Just as he nears the vehicle, a masked individual from a nearby building shoots at the car and hastily retreats. However, the person's escape is short-lived as he is quickly apprehended by the soldiers. James utilizes a fire extinguisher to put out the flames and proceeds to examine the car while Owen and Sanborn assume their positions as lookouts. In the next scene, James unlocks the trunk and discovers several artillery shells, similar to the ones he encountered before. After a few moments, he decides to remove his bomb suit entirely, realizing it offers no real protection. It becomes apparent that the explosive in the car is potent enough to cause widespread casualties, including his fellow soldiers, even if they seek cover. With this realization, James believes that discarding the suit will at least provide him with a more comfortable death, and he won't look like a friggin' idiot. He then proceeds to disarm the shells and meticulously searches the car for the triggering device, a task that takes several minutes. A 
At one point, Sanborn attempts to communicate with James through a headset, but our hero finds it distracting, so he throws away the device. Meanwhile, Owen and Sanborn observe several groups of Iraqis watching them from rooftops and a minaret, including a person who is recording their actions with a video camera. Eventually, James locates the triggering device in the car and safely removes it, successfully concluding the mission. He then returns to his vehicle and lights a cigarette to unwind, but soon receives a punch from Sanborn for not acknowledging him during the operation. Next time you do it, Sanborn, you bitch. Later that day, Colonel Reed approaches James, clearly impressed by his composure and ability to handle such a high-stress situation. The colonel inquires about the number of bombs he has disarmed till this date, and James confidently provides an exact count of 873. Legendary. The next day, the team ventures into the desert in order to carry out controlled detonations of the collected explosives from previous missions. Shortly after, James realizes he left his gloves near the blast zone, so he quickly drives back to retrieve them. During his absence, Sanborn contemplates triggering a bomb to kill James intentionally and disguise it as an accident. However, Owen manages to persuade him against such an unethical act. After completion of their task, the team is heading back to the city when they come across two parked SUVs with a group of armed individuals. Sanborn gets off the vehicle and commands them to lower their weapons. The men comply, and one of them reveals himself as a British commando, asserting that they are on the same side. He then seeks help with a flat tire, and the bomb squad agrees to lend a hand. While repairing the tire, a wrench man is unexpectedly shot in the back. The team is caught off guard as gunfire erupts around them, prompting everyone to seek cover. Soon after, another British commando is killed while manning the Hummer's machine gun. The British team leader positions himself as a sniper on a small rocky hill and begins to retaliate, targeting a stone-made hut from where the enemy sniper and their group are firing. However, while adjusting the rifle's bipod, the leader is fatally struck in the chest by the enemy sniper. After this, Sanborn takes over the sniper position, while James uses a powerful scope to assist him in locating the enemy. After firing several shots, Sanborn runs out of ammunition. So, James instructs Owen to search the pockets of the deceased commando. Although Owen finds a full magazine, the bullets seem to have become jammed due to the man's blood. As a result, James steps in and whips out that sweet bow and arrow. I mean, he cleans the magazine himself. After this, James and Sanborn get back to their positions and eliminate the enemy combatants one by one, finally claiming victory. Later that night, Night, the guys have a party at James's living quarters, engaging in playful chest pounding and indulging in drinks. During this time, Sanborn discovers James's collection of components gathered from nearly every bomb he has disarmed. James explains that he keeps them as reminders of the ever-present danger he faces. On their next mission, Colonel Cambridge accompanies the bomb squad to a building where bomb-making materials have been reported. Upon reaching there, Cambridge remains outside, while the team conducts a search within the premises. Inside, they discover the supplies used to manufacture bombs, along with evidence indicating that the perpetrators have recently fled. In one of the rooms, James comes across the lifeless body of a young boy with a large incision on his chest. Upon a closer look, he recognizes him as the little seller from earlier, Beckham. James then instructs Sanborn and Owen to vacate the building, as he needs to examine the boy's body for bombs. Initially overwhelmed by sorrow, James eventually controls himself and proceeds to dissect the boy's abdomen, retrieving explosives hidden in plastic. He then carries the deceased boy outside and places him in a vehicle. Meanwhile, Cambridge continues his efforts to clear the locals from the surrounding area. James calls out to him, urging him to get into the vehicle, but a sudden detonation from another improvised explosive device claims Cambridge's life instantly. Witnessing this tragic event, Owen struggles to accept Cambridge's death and aimlessly searches for him, but James manages to comfort him. On the following day, James talks to the merchant with whom Beckham used to work. He inquires about Beckham's whereabouts, but the merchant feigns ignorance, claiming that he doesn't understand English. Suspicious that the merchant is potentially leaking their internal information, James decides to take action. So, he forcefully jumps into the merchant's truck and asks him to drive towards Beckham's house. The terrified man does as asked, and he drops James at the location before hastily fleeing. Upon entering the house, James finds a guy in the kitchen who appears frightened but surprisingly welcoming. He demands information regarding Beckham's location, but the man is unaware. This is when James realizes that the merchant has taken him to the wrong place. As he's about to leave, he stumbles upon the man's wife, who reacts with anger and begins berating him for his intrusion. James navigates his way back through the city towards the military base, passing numerous locals who appear visibly upset. Upon reaching the main gate, he identifies himself as a U.S. soldier and makes up a false story, claiming he had been at a whorehouse. Later that night, the team receives a call to investigate another bomb explosion site. As they 
they arrive, they discover that a bomb, likely from a suicide bomber, had detonated near an oil tanker truck, resulting in the deaths of several residents. James assesses the perimeter of the blast area for a while and forms the theory that the bomber did not commit the unthinkable, but instead triggered the explosion from a location outside the perimeter. Filled with anger, James vows to locate the bomber and directs his comrades to conduct separate searches in nearby alleys. Shortly after, James and Sanborn hear a gunshot from where Owen is located, so the two rush to his aid. They witness Owen being dragged away by two unidentified men. In response, they pursue the kidnappers and shoot at them, killing them on the spot. But during the commotion, James inadvertently shoots Owen in the leg. In the morning, James and Sanborn rendezvous with Owen at the helicopter, which is about to transport him to the hospital. Owen expresses bitterness towards James for accidentally shooting him, stating that his femur is shattered and recovery will require several months. He also chastises James for putting his teammates in difficult situations solely to satisfy his personal vengeance. The scene then cuts to another mission, where James and Sanborn arrive to find a lone man standing in the middle of a large plaza, with his body padlocked with several bombs. The man pleads for mercy, emphasizing that he has a family. James approaches the man and discovers that the bombs have a two-minute timer. He frantically attempts to cut the locks, but realizes that there are simply too many of them. This leaves James with no option but to apologize to the man and run away. Seconds later, the bomb detonates, claiming the man's life and propelling James away. Sanborn rushes to the scene, fearing that James has suffered the same fate as Matt, but fortunately, he is only stunned and eventually regains his composure. During the drive back to the base, Sanborn, who is still shaken by the incident, confides in James, expressing his fear of dying in Iraq without even experiencing the joys of marriage or parenthood. In response, James consoles his friend, assuring him that he will make it back home and have the opportunity to start a family unless his dick gets blown off by a bomb. Finally, the team's rotation comes to an end and James returns to his home and family. However, he struggles with the simplicity of civilian life and finds it challenging to readjust. He should try diffusing arguments on Twitter. He'd feel right at home. As a result, he makes the decision to return to Iraq. Uh, no one told him about Twitter. In the final scene, James is depicted as part of a different bomb disposal unit, and he goes on a new mission, continuing his passion for diffusing bombs and saving lives. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.